Uh, hello everyone, thank you for coming. Um, with our previous two speakers, we had um, more of the practical side of things, as in, in terms of NGOs, what we do. Uh, I'm going to try explain in a theoretical aspect um, as faith, who are faith-based organizations, both in terms of humanitarian relief, uh, in terms of NGOs as well, uh, where they're derived from, and I'm going to try use a more theoretical and academic perspective, so to speak. Now, at the moment, when we look at the Middle East, um, and when we look out throughout the world, we see world governments throughout the world, throughout various regions, using realist perspectives. So by using realist perspectives, we can see arms races going forth, and who's affected the most? Populations are affected the most. So what we need is a uh, neoliberal institutionalist approach. So faith-based organizations and NGOs need to, need to be put in the forefront more. Due to uh, the world population at the moment, moment, the world populace at the moment, not trusting governments due to their politics. So firstly, uh, I'd like to define what is a faith-based organization. Now, a faith-based organization, according to Clark and Jennings 2008, is any organization that derives inspiration and guidance for its activities from teachings and principles of the faith or from a particular interpretation or school of thought within that faith. Again, to add on to this, uh, Scott 2003 had stated that, at a minimum, Faith-based organizations must be connected with an organized faith community in terms of const uh, constituency. These connections occur when a, a faith-based organization is based on a particular ideology and draws staff, volunteers, or leadership from a particular religious group. Other characteristics that qualify an organization as faith-based a religious, religiously oriented mission statements, the receipt of substantial support from a religious organization, or the initiation by a uh, religious institution. So, going on from this, again, both uh, Jennings and Clark had came up with a fourfold scheme to organize uh, faith-based organizations. So, Faith-based organizations can be organized into four, these being passive, active, persuasive, and finally, exclusive. So when we say passive faith-based organizations, what we mean is uh, teachings of faith are subsidiary to broader humanitarian principles and, plan, uh, and play a secondary role to humanitarian considerations in identifying beneficiaries and partners. So moving on to a more active approach with faith-based organization, uh, faith is the important and explicit motivation for action and for mobilizing staff and supporters and plays a direct role in identifying beneficiaries and partners. So faith is uh, the religion and faith is, is the main motivation for doing things. So when we ask a faith-based NGO, why are you doing this? It's not a matter of uh, money or wealth, but rather spirituality, which is an advantage uh, in which faith-based organizations have. So thirdly, when we mention persuasive faith-based organization, faith is an important and explicit motivation for action and plays a significant role in identifying beneficiaries and partners. In addition to active faith-based organization, persuasive uh, faith-based organizations uh, are dominant on the basis for re-engagement. So uh, this aims to bring new converts to the faith as well. So lastly, when we speak about exclusive faith-based organizations, faith provides the overriding motivation for action in mobilizing staff and supporters. It provides the principal consideration in identifying beneficiaries. Social and political engagement is rooted in the faith and 
this often goes to either uh, militant sides or other types of violence as well. So in terms of uh, history of faith-based organizations, plus where the actual uh, the concept of charity is derived from, the concept of charity in faith-based organizations is usually derived from you know, the four major religions, so you know, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and Hinduism as well. So in Islam, we've got two uh, major words, so to speak. So we've got the term sadaqah and zakah. So when we mention sadaqah, what we mean is voluntary charity that's given. So any, anyone could give that. When we mean zakah, uh, what we mean is obligatory charity, a charity that must be given by, by people who can give that. And so this is a pillar of faith as well. So this can be used as motivation as well. So when we look at Judaism, we've got the word uh, tzedakah, which means charity, and is central to the faith of Judaism as well. Uh, the Jewish philosopher Maimonides ranked eight levels in hierarchy from the lowest, which is giving with a heavy heart, to the highest, which is being supportive of uh, self-sufficiency. So when we look at the Bible, again, we could see the Bible encouraging charity as well. Uh, specifically with uh, words you know, used to, such as you know, supporting strangers, widows, orphans, and other vulnerable members of society as well. So uh, Hinduism, again, has a charity as a pillar as well, including giving alms and ritual feeding of the poor. The term seva is used here, uh, which means expressing spirituality. So just some brief history, uh, we, in the mid-1800s, with uh, modern, modernization coming, uh, coming as well, we could see that uh, Christianity had brought reforms as well. So slavery was abolished, uh, prison reforms had taken place, and humane treatment of the mentally ill was uh, present as well. Within this time frame, popular humanists such as Henry Dunant and Florence Nightingale had came about as well. Though there's a criticization for this time frame as well, as missionary organizations who are faith-based organizations uh, doing humanitarian aid work were criticized with working with colonial forces and colonial governments. Uh, so they were criticized with their constituencies as well. So this had engaged international humanitarian work as well within the 1800s. Again, though this brought uh, both secular organizations and faith-based organizations to the forefront. So I'm going to have to rush through. I think we've got, okay? okay. okay. So in terms of faith-based organizations, there are a couple of distinctions between faith-based organizations and secular uh, organizations. In terms of uh, Distinctions, I'm going to mention two advantages and two disadvantages of faith-based organizations, coming from experience as well. Uh, in terms of advantages, uh, faith-based organizations have unrestricted funding from faith-based communities due to them having a very large constituency. So let's say women, if we look at, let's say, Muslim uh, faith-based organizations, we've got 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, so that's quite a lot of money coming in. Same thing with uh, you know, Christianity and other religions pre present as well. So uh, this allows them to carry out activities not funded by government donors. So they're not restricted to spending that money uh, wherever the government wants. They could spend it whenever, wherever they want. And this could, uh, you could react to emergency situations much easier like this. Also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the motiv motivation of faith-based organizations is not materialistic, uh, but rather spiritual. So this is why they're a part of a vast global network of communities, not linking them together with either funding or programming, but rather just the motivation to help humanity, so to speak. So in terms of disadvantages, I was able to point out 
three from the literature I read plus what I've seen um, in terms of practical knowledge as well. When I went to you know regions like you know Myanmar and the Syrian border and so forth, uh, one disadvantage is neutrality. Due to faith-based organizations being from one school of thought or, or, or from one religion, uh, they tend to send aid to just one region. Though with mm, actual professionalism and code of ethics coming into c consideration at the moment, uh, with this expanding as well, this is diminishing. Also independence, sometimes the actual funds of faith-based organizations or well, a large portion of them come from the government, so they have to work out a middle road as to where they're able to spend this as well, which is a disadvantage. And also problems with uh, faith-based communities as well. So due to the actual constituency being faith-based, if a local cleric says, no, you need to spend the money here, then a crisis comes about. So, in terms of, you know, finally, in terms of uh, how do Muslims see faith-based organizations or how do Muslims see faith-based activities <coughs> in terms of humanitarian relief? Now, there's, in terms of a religious approach, um, you know, they see faith-based activities in terms of humanitarian relief as uh, an obligatory char character. You know, we've got a saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, he states, the first to enter paradise are those who do char charitable works. So as you can see, this is motivation. Secondly, uh, they see it as a fourth, uh, as a, a form of validating faith. So again, uh, we've got another verse which states, uh, those who believed and did charitable works. So specifically charitable works is mentioned there. And again, as I mentioned, sadaqa, which means voluntary, uh, giving alms voluntarily, comes from the word tastik, which means supporting, firming. On a global approach, um, again, Dr. Gulul and Brother Meti had mentioned, in, in terms of uh, you know, Muslim faith-based humanitarian organizations, what do we do? Uh, again, food aid, you know, food parcels being given to people in need. <coughs> and fighting against famine. Uh, secondly, sponsorship of orphans, as in from the organization I work for, we've got about 60,000 uh, orphans being sponsored worldwide at the moment. Again, assistance to refugees. Again, uh, an example from the organization uh, I work for, for the pa for past five years, we've spent approximately 500 million Turkish liras on the Syrian crisis at the moment, which is a, quite a big amount. Uh, Long-term development goals. So one main uh, issue is when you say in regions of Asia, you know, Middle East, and so forth, when there's famine coming about, when there's a crisis coming about, the actual people in the regions there forget where they're coming from in terms of culture, in terms of religion. So you, you'd need to. Uh, support them in this manner for them not to forget where they're coming from, for them not to be assimilated. So for this, long-term development goals, schools, uh, vocational education centers, cultural centers, and so forth. And microcredits for uh, you know, the local constituency, whoever's affected, to uh, start their own businesses and for them to continue on in their life. So you're not fishing for them, you're teaching them how to fish, so to speak. That's all we've got to say.